Let's start. I will start recording now. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. This is uh, uh, the seminar cycle for the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk, the mini j -Pass survey, the galaxy population in the mini j -Pass cluster uh, MJPC 2470 1771 and will be given by uh, Julio Rodriguez. Julio is starting the third year of his PhD here at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía in Granada. He started uh, physics at the University of Granada from 2014 until 2018. And then he studied the master degree in physics and mathematics with the specialty in astronomy and astrophysics. He had already worked at IIA in the summer 2014 with Dr. Matilde Fernandez, Fernandez performing calibrations on a set of stellar spectra. And he now has come back, currently de uh, developing his PhD in the group of galaxy evolution as part of the g -Pass collaboration, focus, focusing on the effects on the environment in galaxy evolution. So thank you very much, uh, Julio, for uh, this talk. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rene. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming here today to my talk. I hope you are having a great day and a great week. So I'm going to, uh, give, to talk to you about the current work that our, our group is doing in the largest cluster detected with mini J-PATS, which is the MJPC 1771 cluster, or simply the cluster for friends. And since our group is the group of galaxy evolution, uh, it's focused in the galaxy populations and the, the star population properties and of this cluster and how it can serve to galaxy evolution studies. So since uh, it has been a long time since the, very likely, since the last time you heard about j -Pass, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction about what is this survey and why it is so powerful and why it is interesting. j -Pass stands for Havalambra Physics of the Accelerating Universe Survey. And it's been taking, and um, will soon uh, start to scan thousands of square degrees in the in the sky. And the target is to scan more than 8,000 square degrees, which is a very nice amount of, uh, of sky. And the observations will be take place in the Observatorio Astrofisico de Javalambre, which is ideal for this kind of surveys due to its location. And they will use the JST T250 telescope, which is a telescope of 2.5 meters of diameter and the JPEG cam in order to achieve the, 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 inform, the to retrieve the, the data. The achieved field of goal uh, with these two instruments is, uh, is a very big one. It's 4.2 square degrees, which will, and as you can see in this image, uh, courtesy of the JPAS coloration, which is the first technical light of JPAS, uh, it managed the JPEG cam, it managed to uh, observe the whole Andromeda galaxy in one single pointing. Uh, it will use 14 CCDs with a resolution of 0 0.2267 arc seconds per pixel. And so it will provide also specially resolved uh, data for galaxies that are close enough. But most likely the great power of j -Pass comes from its filter system because it uses 56 now run uh, photometric filters, which are full with half maximum of 145 Armstrong with space by 100 Armstrong each one, uh, covering the, the whole optical spectral range. And, and it achieves a very uh, resolution of 60, which is uh, comparable to a very low resolution spectroscopy. So we have two factors, which is the large field of view uh, without losing too much spectral resolution. 
Uh, in the meantime, we have the data from Mini J Pass, which is a survey of one square degree along the edges strip using the J Pass filter system and the Pathfinder camera, which is uh, has a smaller uh, field of view. But with just four pointings, uh, we, uh, we achieved this one degree. And we already have uh, a lot of data available to prove and to test uh, what we can do with JPAS. It's also publicly available if you want to, to access it through the web page of the collaboration. And you can see that this NIP survey region has also been uh, studied in other surveys such as Lambra or Otelo. And, and here you can see how the night sky looks uh, from, from, from the eyes of Mini J Pass. Okay, so having this large field of view, it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool to develop studies about the environment. Here you can see uh, a figure from uh, the work from Maduri et al., which is in preparation yet. Uh, which is a slide of the over densities of uh, observed with mini J pass at redshift 0 0.24. And here you can see how we have very, uh, very useful data in order to see these over densities and to study the environments of galaxies. And it's also very useful for galaxy evolution. Uh, there's a work, there's already a work published by Gonzalo Delgado et al. Our group uh, showing uh, how this data can be used for galaxy evolution studies. I choose here uh, a figure where you can see uh, the evolution with the redshift of the red and blue galaxies and the properties such as the stellar mass or the age, the intrinsic color, or the metallicity. Okay, so why are we so interested in the environment when? Uh, in denser environments, and when I mean denser environments, I mean uh, galaxies that are near other galaxies that are not isolated. Uh, these galaxies start interacting among them, and this affects their morphology, their properties, the star formation, and there are several uh, processes that take place. Uh, it's just the run pressure stripping, the harassment, the cannibalism, the merging and fusion, the tidal forces. And this is very interesting for galaxy evolution. Uh, some results that I can talk to you about to give you a little bit of context. Uh, for example, the work from, this, from Dressler 1980, which found that as the density rose, the, so did the fraction of elliptical and SO galaxies. And in consequence, the, the fraction of irregular and spiral galaxies decreases. Uh, in Dressler et al. in 1985, also found that in, they've uh, less emission line galaxies in, in the cluster, which are denser environments. Kaufman et al. in 1984 found that the density strongly affects the stellar mass distribution. And in this figure, you can see that. Uh, the fraction of the mass in the local, the stellar mass in the local universe, and each color represents a density being. The cyan is the lowest density one, and then goes from cyan, blue, uh, black, green, black, and red. And for example, the, the 4000 break, which is a very important uh, indicator for a stellar population. Uh, you can see a clear difference between less dense environments and denser environments. In the same year, Balog et al. found uh, uh, a very uh, result that is being used a lot by us, and is that the, red, the fraction of red galaxies increases with the density. And but we can also talk about the butter omler effect, which was first uh, announced in 1978, which found that as the redshift increased, the fraction of blue galaxies uh, in the core of clusters also increased. So name a, a more recent study, Pengedal uh, in 2010, found that the star formation rate of galaxies uh, was independent of the environment at a given mass, which is what this figure represents. You have uh, the mass and the star formation does change, but 
uh, if you pick up fix as the uh, and and you start to use the uh, to look at the, the density uh, the the star formation does barely change okay so how are we going to use to to study this density so we, how are we going to detect these clusters and groups well, we have a code, which is a MICRO, which stands for Adaptive Match Identifier of Cluster Objects, uh, which is the one that is being used in UniJPass to detect the groups and clusters. Uh, it is based on the optical filtering technique, which uses a noise in a template to try to reproduce the signal, and it uses several inputs, such as the distance of galaxies to the what we consider the center of the of the of the density and uh, the, the brightness of the galaxies, etc. And it also provides an association probability for each galaxy to, uh, to each group. Uh, if the group is very far off, of course, the probability is zero. But uh, we can also use this probability to, for our studies, and we do indeed, and, and we use this probability as a criteria to select the, the members of the cluster that I'm going to talk about. And a very um, and the thing that must be said about Amico is that it also works very well for low mass groups. And, and there's also a uh, work in preparation about the uh, star population properties of the of all the, the groups detected with Amico. OK, so let's talk about the data, because I've talked to you how the, about the filter system. and. So now this, I'm going to show you how the, the data or how a galaxy looks from the eyes of JPAS. And these are six examples of six galaxies belonging to our cluster. The three upper ones are red galaxies and the, the three bottom ones are blue galaxies. As you can see, uh, just, for, just using the photo spectra, you can see the, some difference. For example, then in the 4000 break, it is, it's appreciable that uh, it's different for red and blue galaxies. And another, another very interesting thing is that, is that thanks to having so many narrowman filters and so close, GPAS allows us to detect emission lines. Uh, for example, you can see here H alpha, oxygen three, oxygen two, as this peaks as these filters that are brighter than the neighbors, and not only night brighter than the neighbors. And, and this is very nice, but in order to perform our studies, we do require a code to find the, the set, the, the spectral energy distribution of these galaxies. So that's why we use BASIGAL, which is a code that has been developed by the Amorin et al. In the work, in the paper is, is still in preparation, but as I mentioned, the, the work by Gonzalo Delgado et al. already used it and proved how effective and how well it works. Uh, it is a parametric set fitting code which uses Bayesian statistics and a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach in order to find the best fitting for the, the stellar continuum, which are the, the black dots that you see here, the color dots are the, the observed magnitudes and the, the, the black dots are the, the fitted ones. And since it, it must assume a, a star formation history parameter for this work, we are assuming a tau delayed model, which is this equation that you're seeing here. And it depends on two parameters and T sub zero, which is the look back time uh, on when the star formation began is in look back time, you know, the larger it is, the, the further away is in time. And tau, which represents uh, how extended in time this star, the, how extended or how wide this exponential is. Since it is a variation code, we can uh, marginalize the parameters that we are interested in and, and basically provides the stellar mass, the metallicity, the extension, and T sub zero and tau. And we are also able to calculate the, the star ages through these parameters. As I mentioned, uh, let me insist once more, uh, given this large field of view that JPAS has, we can retrieve a lot of data from a lot of galaxies, and even special results if 
if we want if we want to perform such kind of studies. And due to its filter system, the we can perform these fits of the stellar continuum and retrieve these properties, which is what we require for the galaxy evolutions. And uh, for example, and um, here's another example from the work from Gonzalo Delgado et al. And where you you can see the the, log, the the mass with h as a function of the stellar mass, and in color code the, the different properties uh, the, of of these stellar populations. For example, the metallicity, the extinction, the rest frame color. So it's a very powerful tool. So, but let's go uh, into the what we are interested. In uh, which is the cluster. Here you can see a, a photograph of the cluster as seen by, by Mini J Pass. And there you can see six the six same galaxies that I show you the spectra, three blue galaxies and three red galaxies. In particular, this is the, the BCG, which is, stands for brightest cluster galaxy. And, and we're going to consider that this is the center of the cluster. We have another image here, which is the, um, as I mentioned, the, the probability, the association probability given by Amico to each cluster member. And, and here you can see the BCG. And this is the R200 uh, uh, radius, which uh, is the distance at which the density, uh, the mass density is 200 times the density of the universe at the cluster redshift. And the most notable things are too is that the galaxies with greater probability are the ones closest to the closer to the BCG, and that the observations are incomplete due to the the, the, the limit of the observations, the limit of the field of view. And so the clusters, uh, we know that we are very likely missing galaxies over here. But we do still manage to to uh, achieve to find very nice results with this data. Here are the histograms for the stellar population properties. You can see the the mass, the extinction, the the metallicity, the the rest frame color, the age, and tau divided by t sub zero, which represents uh, how extended in time it was the star formation compared to to how long took it place very low values indicate that the star formation stopped a long time ago and higher values indicate that the star formation stopped or or not so long ago or that maybe it's even taking place today we used two photometries in this work uh, which are the psf core photometry which has a smaller aperture so and has and it has a better signal to noise and the outer photometry which has a larger aperture and it includes outer regions of uh, of the galaxies and as you can see the the results do not change that much the most noticeable thing is that mass is a little bit higher for auto and it's galaxies are a little bit bluer for auto too due to this inclusion of uh, of the outer regions but the most interesting thing that we can do with this uh, plot is to compare them with the results of the whole ages populations. Uh, and what we find is that the mass is more concentrated in the range of 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses. And the ages more, are more or less within this range. But the most uh, important thing to note is that we have a much higher fraction of red galaxies uh, in this cluster when compared to the whole ages field in fact this can this can be proved that this can be checked with the with the mass color diagrams uh, here which uh, in the top panels you see the rest frame color and in the bottom panels you see the intrinsic color and we use the the color on the color code to to mark stellar population properties, and the size of the dots uh, are proportional to their to their probability. And along this work, uh, that's holds true uh, unless I 
instead of the, the contrary. And once we change from the, the rest frame color to the intrinsic color correcting from extinction, we can apply the criteria developed by Diaz Garcia et al to distinguish between red and blue galaxies, which is this line galaxies above it are certainly red and galaxies below it are blue. As you can see, uh, if you consider the, the extinction, these galaxies that will be in the valley when we correct from extinction, uh, move into the blue cloud. And the most notable thing is, uh, and here is very clear that we have our orbital density when we compare of red galaxies when we compare to the when we compare it to the the, the population of of the whole ages field in the in this redshift being, which is the, the cluster redshift. But the distribution of the star properties is, uh, remains the same. I mean, blue galaxies tend to be younger and to be more metallic, although the, the metallicity is, is more or less the same for all the galaxies, but the galaxies with the greater metallicity found here. And, and this is a very, uh, very nice result because the fraction of red galaxies, to give you a number, is 0.49 for us in this cluster compared to the 0 0.2 that is found uh, in the edges field uh, that redshift, which is almost a double. So this is, is telling us that the interaction is actually red in this, this galaxies. We can also study the spatial distribution of these properties. And the main idea that you have to, to, to keep is that the red galaxies are close to as closest to this to the center to the BCG, and they are more massive galaxies, and they are older galaxies, and they are more metallic galaxies. Although, as I said, the metallicity is more or less the same, and so and this gives an idea of how the the cluster and the interaction forms. This is telling us that galaxies in the center, which is a more dense, dense environment and uh, interact between themselves and, and tend to evolve more rapidly. We can also use this data to retrieve the mass density and the mean age. And we, have, we find these results and this is the, the distance, the mass density as a function of the distance to the BCG. And we can see that it clearly decreases for both red and blue galaxies. And we find that uh, the mean age is more or less the same for all red galaxies along the galaxy, the cluster, but uh, there's a slight tendency to uh, stronger ages as you go away from the from the VCG. Uh, when I showed you the spectra, uh, the, 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 the J spectra, I told you that one very interesting thing is that we are able to, to, to see these emission lines. So the next logical step is to try to detect the, this emission line galaxies and study them separately. But we need a method to do this systematically and not just by looking uh, at galaxy one by one. Um, and establish uh, and say, well, this looks like an emission galaxy or this one not. So we established two, two methods. The first one is the median network methods, which consists in looking at the filter that is closer to the H alpha emission, to the observed H alpha wavelength, uh, considering the, the galaxy redshift. And we compute the median error of the observed magnitudes. Uh, it, that are the closest uh, the, of the five closest filter to H alpha. Uh, and we take a theta, which is a multiplicative constant, and this builds our threshold. And if the difference between the, the, the fit and the observed magnitude is greater than this threshold, then we consider it is an emission line galaxy. Uh, we have we set this is manually tuned and in order to achieve the best fit uh, we choose the theta to be three for red galaxies and one for blue galaxies and this has a reason and is that and it's because blue galaxies tend to be 
much longer here than in red galaxies. And if we chose the same value and the same threshold for, for both of them, uh, we will either be losing a lot of blue emission line galaxies because the criteria is too strict for them, or we will be getting too many red galaxies uh, that are classified as um, emission line galaxies, but in fact, they are not because the error is very small and, and maybe it's just a small variation and this threshold uh, goes up uh, and they go over this threshold. And the other method is based in the artificial neural networks uh, built by Martinez Light and, and tal, by Ginés. And I think he will tell you more about them in November. If you, so stay tuned if you want to know more about them. But the basic idea is and what you have to know is that these neural network neural neural networks are trained uh, to calculate the, the equivalent width of several uh, line emission lines, and we choose H alpha as a reference again. And what we do is that following the the work from Pascual Edal, two thousand and seventy, we choose this value, uh, which is the the equivalent width of the filter divided by the signal to noise of the filter minus one is the minimum uh, equivalent width that can be measured by a photometric filter. So if our measurement of the equivalent width of H alpha plus its error to consider the top of the, of the error box is greater than this minimum value, uh, we consider that the galaxy is an emission line galaxy. We also impose that uh, the measurement must be greater than its error in order to avoid galaxies that are just noise. So we have two, these two methods. And you can see here in this histogram of the intrinsic color distribution that they give very similar results. The median error is the cyan one and the AIM and the artificial network networks is the green one. And they have a very similar distribution, but since our method is tuned in order to looking for completeness rather than, than precision, than, than purity of the sample, we choose to keep just the intersection of both methods, which is this solid histogram. Uh, so we are more sure that these galaxies are in fact uh, emission line galaxies. You can also see this comparison, this distribution compared to the, to the cluster. And, and the most important thing is that most of them are blue galaxies, then, which is what we will expect because we are looking at H alpha. You can also see here the distribution of H alpha in the, in the UI minus R, uh, the, the color mass diagram and in the histogram. And you can see the most important th thing to see is that the lowest values of the equivalent width are found in the in red galaxies, and blue galaxies take all the higher values of the equivalent width, which is which is what we will be expecting. Uh, but since we have red emission line galaxies, we have to consider the possibility of having uh, active galactic nuclei in our galaxy, in our, in our cluster. So we're going to try to uh, determine um, the, the possible presence of, of them. And you can see here two examples of galaxies. This will be a, a very strong star forming galaxy, which uh, with, with its continuum very, very weak and with very strong emission lines. And this is the, the sample of, a, this is an, ex, an example of a Cypher 2 galaxy, which was also confirmed by spectroscopy uh, with all the data. And, and what we use to distinguish between this are the one diagrams and the BPT diagrams. Uh, the one diagram was, uh, 88, uh, was uh, first, designed by Steve Fernandez et al. in 2010. Um, well, the PPT diagram is a very common tool. So we are using four lines, what well, three or four lines, depending on the, the criteria. If the galaxy is 
beyond it is at the left of the cotton on 2003 uh, transportation. We consider that this is in a star forming galaxy. If it's at the right of QLE 2001, we know it's safer. If it is above the QLE 2006 uh, threshold for a H alpha, um, for H alpha, if it's below, it could be a liner or it could be a retired galaxy. And in BP tech diagram, we use the same criteria, uh, but without the distance positions. So this is what the, the whole cluster looks in these diagrams. And as you can see, most of the galaxies are uh, start forming. There are some galaxies that fall in this intermediate region, which are harder to classify. And if you look at the one, we only have, we'll have one safer galaxy for sure even though there are some more galaxies that could potentially be uh, uh, a safer galaxy. And the, the BPT diagram, it looks a little bit different, but uh, in the case of that, we give more priority to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the one diagram since it only uses H-alpha and nitrogen two. To, to classify the galaxies rather than oxygen three and H beta. And, and this is because if the narrow, if there is no uh, oxygen three emission, the measurement of the neural network cannot be trusted that much. So the results are that most of the emission line galaxies are most likely star forming galaxies about the 62%, about, 20% being very, very, very generous could be, could have a safer too. But, um, and I let me insist in the cold, not in the that they have. And, and the rest are liner galaxies or, or retired galaxies. Uh, moving on, mm, I have spoken about the star formation histories here. So we can also study uh, these parameters in, in the cluster. So we focus in four parameters that come from two, which is T0, as I mentioned, the, the greater the value of T0, the longest ago the star formation began, tau divided by T0, the smaller it is, the, the narrower the distribution is, or the, the narrower the, 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 the star formation is. is. T max, which, which is the time, the look back time when the maximum of the star formation history was reached, and delta T sub Q, which is the look back time when the, um, the star formation history uh, decayed until, uh, until the 10% of the, of the maximum value. So what we are seeing is that T0 shows a very similar distribution for all the uh, galaxies uh, here for red and blue galaxies. But if we divide the galaxies in the galaxies outside R200, this circle that we plotted before, and the galaxies, uh, the galaxies inside, sorry, and the galaxies outside, what we find is that the, those galaxies with lower values of T0 are mainly blue galaxies located out of uh, in the outskirts of the cluster. Uh, the same goes for the higher values of the of tau divided by T sub zero, which uh, as I, um, which will indicate that these galaxies uh, have had wider wider uh, star formation periods. And for the time where the maximum uh, of the star formation was reached, in fact, you can see there are some negative values for this maximum, which means that these galaxies are yet to reach the, to reach it, as we are talking in, in look back time. Meanwhile, red galaxies are all located in this low values of tau divided by T sub zero, and in the low values and the high values of, of, of the T max. Which this and in the end the, the results for delta T sub Q are more or less the same galaxies uh, that uh, took more time to um, to reach that uh, ten percent point or to, to that decrease in, in the star formation history are mainly blue galaxies as I uh, 
uh, the cluster in the outer regions of the cluster. So this picture is could be could be interpreted as a quenching, uh, as a consequence of the quenching, since uh, red galaxies are mainly in the, uh, mainly in the core of the cluster, and we can see that they have evolved more rapidly. The star formation has already stopped. Meanwhile, blue galaxies are still forming stars, especially those that are in the outer regions, which are less dense regions, and they do not suffer so much the interaction on the, on the gravitational uh, potation, potential of the, of the cluster. Uh, we can also study the star formation rates, although we are using the, the specific star formation rate, which is the star formation rate divided by the star mass. And what we see is we study in first place the, the main sequence of the star formation. And since I remember what I mentioned before, PS, the PSF core photometry uses a, a smaller aperture than the auto photometry. Nor, uh, usually blue stars are located in the outer regions uh, of galaxies. And this means that PSF core could be taking out these regions where new, where massive star, blue stars, new stars are being formed, and it could affect our studies on the star formation rates. So we choose to uh, use both photometries and see the difference. And the color code we use is blue blue dots are the galaxies uh, are blue galaxies that are both both blue when we consider PSF core and the auto photometry. Same holds true for the red galaxy, for the red dots and red galaxies. And galaxies that appear as red when we use the PSF core photometry, but change to blue when we use the auto photometry and the, and the same uh, criteria as, the, as I mentioned before, this that black dashed line, are the ones in gray, and we could name them transition galaxies. Uh, the galaxies with uh, with white dots are emission line galaxies and the galaxies with a star in them inside them are galaxies with which uh, their star formation in the last 20 mega years uh, is under the zero two point the zero point two percent of the total mass and this is a very interesting result because uh, as I mentioned, what you can see is if we use the PSF core, these galaxies that appear red uh, are located here in the closest part to the main sequence of the star formation. But if we use the auto photometry, they do fit in this uh, main sequence, although some of them are starting to, to exceed the, the main sequence. Um, a very nice check is that the galaxies with lower mass and uh, highest specific star formation rate are actually emission line galaxies, uh, which will be expected since H alpha is a tracer of the star formation rate. So this result could indicate that we are even able uh, to, to detect transition galaxies using these two photometries. And last, I want to show you that this the the radial distribution of the of the specific of the mean specific star formation rate for blue, red, and transition galaxies using the PSF core and the auto photometry. This dashed line represents the criteria about Pengadal in 2010, and galaxies above this line are considered to be star forming and galaxies below them, below this line are considered to be uh, quasar galaxies. So it is very interesting to see some things. The first one is that for red galaxies, the mean specific star formation rate remains more or less constant. For blue galaxies, uh, the specific star formation rate uh, tends to increase as we go away from the BCG, from the denser regions. And these transition galaxies do in fact change behavior uh, when we change from PSF core to auto photometry. So in conclusion, 
uh, we find that a larger fraction of red galaxies, uh, a larger fraction of red galaxies in the cluster compared to the ages field, we find that red more massive and older and more metallic galaxies are found closer to the BCG. We are able to take emission line galaxies and active conducting nuclei. And our results are also compatible with a scenario where the red galaxies were quenched previously to the accretion to the cluster and blue galaxies are in the process of quenching. And this is what I mentioned before. And the most important conclusion is that JPAS is a very powerful tool for the galaxy evolution and environment studies. And uh, so that's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Julio. And uh, now the, the talk is open for uh, questions. Please raise your hand if you want to do a question and I will give you the, the voice. For doing that, uh, please in the bottom of the screen, you have a reaction button, then uh, you can raise your hand there. So who will be the first? and doing a question to uh, Julio. Here we have one, Ignacio, please, go on. Hi, uh, Julio, uh, oh. very nice uh, results. So it's, not, it's great to see JPAS, mini JPAS uh, starting to work. Um, I was wondering about two things, two technical things. Uh, so in some cases, in some uh, spectral energy distribution that you were showing, the uh, a scatter of the points uh, were larger than the error bars um, with respect to the model that you were fitting. I was wondering um, how much, uh, how much, um, which contribution to this scatter has issues or problem with the photometrical calibration of these uh, uh, filters of JPAS. Um, so can you comment on that? Well, uh, I'm not, I'm not the one who is in the the most detail with the calibrations, but uh, we do know that sometimes JPAS suffers uh, effects from fringing and it could be what is happening in some galaxies, especially red galaxies. Uh, I didn't stop there, but and you can see here two red galaxies. One is in the green valley, but uh, let me put this again. But this one has a, a very high equivalent width of H alpha and it's in the, the red cloud. And this could be fringing effects. So the, that, the data in general is good, but yes, there could be some problems. But, uh, uh, well, I, as I said, I'm not the one who is the, who is really in the, the data, the data I'm working. Uh, my other question is related to the uh, intrinsic galac galactic extinction correction that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, would, you, would you please comment a little bit more of what exactly you are doing and also whether uh, do you make any uh, correction considering the inclination of the galaxies, particularly the spiral ones? Uh, well, we are not considering uh, inclina inclination effects so far. Uh, and we are working with the uh, integrated whole galaxies. And so the answer is no, we are not taking that into account. And, and as a matter of how the extinction works, uh, this is how basic GAL works. Uh, it decomposes the spectra into an extinction, into an extinction, which is, um, sorry, uh, a part that is dependent of the extinction, which is this one, which is the uh, uh, A, here is the extinction and here's the, the spectra. Once we retrieve the all these of the once we have the feed and we have retrieved all these these properties, including the extinction, uh, we go to uh, to our uh, SSP with our single stellar population uh, catalog. Well, it's not catalog, but our our basis, and we use that to to reconstruct the, the intrinsic spectra, and then we can rebuild the the rest frame spectrum. And so you, you assume an, an extinction low depending on the galaxy or or would you just get the extinction internally? Um, well, the, the, the goal itself basically calculates the, the extinction that it requires for in order to fit the spectra. It's in, in their calculation, it, it 
tries to fit uh, say the stellar mass, the metallicity, the extinction, and the, the star formation history in order to achieve the the best fit to to the spectra. So the extinction is part of the parameters that are being fitted to the spectra. And in order to correct the extinction, we use all this information and we go to, I think we are using the the, the virtual base, but um, I have to look uh, at it to give you a share. But we go to our our our, our spectra basis and, and our stellar populations spectra basis, and and that's how we reconstruct. And okay. if, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Other questions for uh, Julio? There is also no questions in the live stream. Maybe we can wait for another shy person that want to ask Julio. There is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't bite anyone, most of, uh, especially because the, the screen is I mean, uh, and I'm physically enabled. <laughs> okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Julio, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, I expect uh, to see next week everybody here uh, for the next seminar. Okay. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, everybody. Bye.